an opening statement. Well, thank you for joining us at today's hearing entitled uh, The Future of Digital Assets, Identifying the Regulatory Gaps in the Digital Asset Market Structure. We've got a unique opportunity as members of this subcommittee to be on the cutting edge of crafting an effective functional regulatory system for the digital assets ecosystem. At this very moment, Chair Johnson and members of the House Agriculture Committee are also holding a similar hearing discussing this same issue. That means that more than 40 members of the U.S. House have an opportunity to work together to ensure that our regulatory framework embodies the key principles of the same activity, same risk, same regulation. Moreover, we'll be holding a joint hearing next month of the House Agriculture Committee to explore these issues together. Two committees working hand in hand on a joint legislative product like this is unprecedented, and I believe it vastly increases our chances of getting it right. Why is legislation needed? The SEC and the CFTC have created an impossible situation where the same firms are subject to competing enforcement actions by the two different agencies. Absent legislation, our regulators are only pushing entrepreneurs, developers, and job creators offshore out of the U.S. system. We have a responsibility to protect our constituents. There are glaring gaps in consumer and investor protections. And regulation by enforcement does nothing to fill that gap. And contrary to arguments by some that the problem is simply nonconformity or noncompliance, it's much more complicated than that. Also, money transmission licenses, as uh, Mr. Gorfine, uh, Gorfine notices, points out, they're insufficient in scope. So today we're going to dive into the current rules that govern our securities and commodity markets and assess how we can address these potential gaps. First, we'll examine the current test to determine if a digital asset is offered as a part of an investment contract and therefore a security. Currently, the SEC and the CFTC disagree on the classification of many digital assets, which is unworkable for entrepreneurs and consumers. The agencies need direction from Congress. Second, the current disclosure regime does not produce information that a reasonable consumer would need to know before considering the purchase of a digital asset. The information that's relevant to the purchaser of a digital asset is different from the information that's relevant when an investor considers purchasing a stock of a public company. Third, we'll explore whether digital asset trading platforms perfectly fit under existing laws and regulations and the rules applicable to digital asset trading platforms. We've got a diverse, knowledgeable panel before us today. Their experiences will help us understand how we can fill these gaps and build a better, more functioning framework. I implore members of this subcommittee to be thoughtful and open-minded with their questions as we seek to take a deep dive into the current regulatory requirements. I look forward to working together on both sides of the aisle to craft the digital asset market structure framework and lead in the right way. Now, let me recognize the ranking member for a four-minute opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and I. I, I realize today is uh, take your child to work day, uh, so uh, some of our staff. So you brought Bill Foster? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he's much younger than my son. Uh, my, my dad was an iron worker, so uh, he did not take me to work, thankfully. Uh, but anyway, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and I thank our witnesses for your willingness to to share your expertise and to help this committee with its work. As we consider the future of digital assets, I, I believe this is an important opportunity to, to really understand the intended and unintended impacts on our traditional financial system that might come about as our uh, collective efforts uh, combine to regulate, change the regulatory landscape for some of these digital products. This hearing focuses on possible gaps in regulation and the need for legislation to fill those gaps, which is a fair and legitimate to topic. I do have some concerns, however, that we may be feeding into a narrative that has been shaped by the digital assets industry itself and, uh, and turn into a tax on the regulatory structure and those individuals leading the regulators, regulatory instu institutions. Digital asset companies often claim that their technology is incompatible with existing law and regulation, when in reality, it may be simply that their business models are incompatible with existing law. 
Over the last couple of years, as the digital asset space has matured, there have been ongoing questions about the ways in which digital assets should be regulated. The industry continues to claim that it lacks regulatory clarity and that its products are so innovative they require their own regulatory regime. The financial services industry has innovated for decades and will likely continue to do so. The U.S. has a, has a comprehensive and long-standing framework of securities law and rules designed to protect investors, promote market integrity, and facilitate capital formation. As I've stated before, I align with the SEC Chair Gensler's assertion that most crypto assets are indeed securities and should be, re should be regulated as such. Chair Gensler has called for cryptocurrency intermediaries to register with the SEC, warning that they may be subject to enforcement action if they do not do so. My hunch is that companies do not do so because they know that they would not meet the standards required and these rules are not compatible with their individual business models. Securities laws exist for a reason. They prevent many of the issues we've seen from failed crypto companies and they cover a multitude of products and services. The SEC has important requirements to protect investors and markets, including the segregation of customer funds, avoiding commingling and capital requirements, customer protection rules, know your customer supervision and compliance and transparency and disclosure. Uh, rather than comply with existing rules, various crypto firms have engaged in legal battles against the SEC and, are, and often argue that they lack guidance on their products. Additional criticism of the SEC appear to conflict. On one hand, the industry and some of my Republican colleagues argue that the SEC has not provided adequate guidance, but on the other hand, they complain that the SEC pursues too many rulemakings and enforcement actions designed to remove that lack of clarity. As we consider legislation, it's important to note that neither the administration, investors, the SEC, or financial regulators have called for any. It seems unnecessary to reinvent the rules when we already have a regulatory regime that is indeed effective. Our financial system is the envy of the world because of investor confidence, which comes from these rules. And we could easily become the envy of the world in the digital asset space if we simply had digital asset companies comply with existing laws. So I look forward to the uh, debate and discussion and from learning more from our experts. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the ranking member and I turn now to the uh, chairman of the full committee, Mr. McHenry of North Carolina for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I want to thank you for how you've conducted this subcommittee and the collegial efforts we're trying to, uh, you're trying to lead to build consensus here. Digital assets are here to stay. Uh, this ecosystem has been denied legal clarity for too long, and both market participants and consumers are worse off because of it. We have a market that lacks clarity, and we have a duty to create regulatory, a regulatory environment that allows responsible innovation and responsible consumer protection to sit side by side with appropriate legal clarity. We need that innovation here in the United States. If we don't act, if Congress doesn't act, the rest of the world will. The Europeans are ahead of us in a market structure bill. Uh, the UK uh, regime is ahead of us. They've provided legal clarity while we have not. We need to do our work and it starts here in this subcommittee with these members. And I want to thank this panel uh, for their expertise in bringing, bringing forward uh, ideas on how to protect consumers and ensure innovation happens here. Yield back. I thank the chairman. And now it's my pleasure to call on the ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Waters of California, for one minute. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, last week, I questioned SEC's Chair Gensler if the agency has the authorities it needs to bring crypto companies and exchanges into compliance with our securities laws, which have served investors and the markets for the past 90 years. His response was unequivocally yes, and the SEC's success in the courts proves his point. Despite uh, those, uh, what those across the aisle may say, we do not need to create an entirely new and special framework for crypto. We already have one. Rather, crypto firms, like other tech companies before them, must recognize that they are not exceptional. They need to comply with the laws of the land to the extent there are 
actual gaps in our laws, such as limitations on the SEC's reach overseas, we should focus on those and not on creating more complexity through a whole new regulatory framework. Later on, I hope I will be able to ask some questions. I yield back and thank you very much. I thank the ranking member. Today we welcome the testimony of uh, a great panel of witnesses. Marta Belcher is the president and chair of Falcoin Foundation as well as the general counsel and head of policy for Protocol Labs. Daniel Gorfine is an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown Law School, as well as the founder and CEO of Gataka Horizons LLC. Previously, he was the CFTC's first chief innovation officer and director of Lab CFTC. Joshua Rivera, Mr. Rivera serves as general counsel of Blockchain Capital, a leading venture capital firm in the industry. Zachary uh, Zyrahorn, uh, is a partner at Davis Polk, where he specializes in financial institutions, fintech, and digital assets. And finally, our panel includes Hillary Allen. Ms. Allen is professor of law and associate dean for scholarship at American University and Washington College of Law, where she teaches courses on banking, securities regulation, and business associations. We thank each of you for taking time to be with us today. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony without objection. Each of your written statements will be made a full part of our record. Mrs. Belcher, we'll start with you. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, Chairman McHenry, and Ranking Member Waters for, for inviting me to testify today. I'm Marta Belcher. I'm president and chair of Filecoin Foundation, one of many organizations working on a cryptocurrency called Filecoin. While this hearing is in the Committee on Financial Services, I want to emphasize today that cryptocurrency is about so much more than finance. Cryptocurrency is already creating a better internet, providing an alternative to big tech that puts people in control of their own data. This technology is also preserving some of the world's most important information, including government data, evidence of human rights abuses, and critical scientific data sets. Today, I'd like to explain how. Today's internet is centralized. The vast majority of data is stored by three companies, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. This creates single points of failure. When these companies suffer blackouts, large swaths of the web go down for hours. This also means that we live our lives through a handful of corporations. We have no choice but to trust them with our data and they have unilateral control over what we can do and say online. Cryptocurrency provides an alternative. Cryptocurrency creates the ability to program money, to send value across the globe instantly and automatically with no intermediary when a condition is met. For example, you can write a computer program that says, for every second of a song I play, automatically transfer a millionth of a cent from me to the songwriter. Filecoin uses programmable money to create a decentralized file storage network. It's like Airbnb for file storage. You can rent out your digital storage space to people who pay you to store their files or pieces of their files. A computer program regularly checks that you're still storing the files and you are automatically paid in Filecoin. Using the Filecoin token enables the network to operate in a way that is peer-to-peer, -peer, instant, automatic, and trustless. Filecoin is a foundational technology for the next generation of the web. Filecoin puts users in control of their data, finally giving them an alternative to big tech. It also allows users to store many copies of their files, so data remains accessible even if some devices fail. There are thousands of individuals and small businesses serving as Filecoin storage providers. Some of them are in the audience today. They're contributing more than 15 billion gigabytes of capacity to the Filecoin network. That's enough to store all written works since the beginning of recorded history, 10 times over. That storage space is being used to preserve humanity's most important information. For example, Filecoin is storing copies of open data sets created by NASA, NIH, and the National Weather Service. Filecoin is also important for government documents because it can solve the problem of link rot, the fact that over time, many links in important documents like congressional records no longer work. 
Harvard's Library Innovation Lab is exploring how these technologies can ensure that links work permanently. Human rights defenders leverage Filecoin to help collect, verify, and preserve data. For example, Starling Lab, a project of Stanford and USC, recently submitted evidence of Russian war crimes in Ukraine. They submitted that to the International Criminal Court and used Filecoin to both preserve this digital evidence and also verify that it was authentic and had not been tampered with. Filecoin also stores important scientific information, like genomic, satellite, and climate data sets from institutions like the Atlas Experiment at CERN. Filecoin Foundation is also working with Lockheed Martin on a satellite launch to demonstrate how the technology underlying Filecoin can speed up communications in space. As these examples show, cryptocurrency is about so much more than financial services, and regulating cryptocurrencies like financial services could undermine these valuable use cases. Regulations that insert intermediaries and add friction are incompatible with these technologies. It is critical that any cryptocurrency regulation protects users' ability to transact directly with each other. It is critical to recognize the open source, decentralized nature of this technology and to acknowledge our country's free speech protections for writing computer code. And it is critical to provide clarity, safe harbors, and compliance on ramps so that innovators can continue to operate in the United States. In drafting cryptocurrency regulation, I urge the committee to consider the many valuable use cases of cryptocurrency beyond financial services to ensure this innovation can continue to thrive. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mr. Gorfine, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Subcommittee Chairman Hill and Ranking Member Lynch, Committee Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify, testify before you today. My name is Daniel Gorfine. I'm the founder and CEO of Gattaca Horizons, an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law, and the former Chief Innovation Officer at the CFTC. The testimony presented here today reflects my own views. The topic of today's discussion has featured prominently both during and after my time in government. Nevertheless, the fundamental regulatory landscape for digital assets in the US, especially at the federal level, has not changed significantly since the inception of Bitcoin in 2009. The current landscape remains one where spot or cash digital commodity trading activity, which means the buying and selling of an asset for immediate delivery, is largely regulated at the state level. Notably, under the status quo, spot market digital commodity exchanges are not subject to comprehensive federal market oversight and supervision. This would require new and explicit authorization from Congress. But let me step back and unpack the current landscape a bit further. FinCEN determined in 2013 that digital asset exchanges are money service businesses. Following FinCEN, many states have required exchanges to secure a money transmission license pursuant to each state's respective law. Some states have gone further and created tailored crypto regulatory frameworks, including, for example, the New York Bit license. State frameworks do impose meaningful requirements on intermediaries. These frameworks do not, however, uniformly impose the same types of markets and trading oversight as is common with federal market regulation. For example, state money transmitter regulation would typically not impose market surveillance requirements intended to detect fraudulent or manipulative trading activity, including wash trading and spoofing. Beyond FinCEN in the states, the CFTC, the SEC, and the federal banking regulators apply their respective rules depending on the type of digital asset and intermediary and the involved activity. The CFTC's jurisdiction over digital assets was established in 2015 when the commission determined that Bitcoin met the definition of commodity. However, the CFTC's jurisdiction over spot commodity markets is quite limited. While the CFTC does have enforcement authority to police for fraud and manipulation, this authority is backward looking and invoked only when wrongdoing is suspected. And this authority is not oversight authority, which entails rulemaking and the registration and regular examination of intermediaries. This key point is commonly confused because the CFTC does have authority over derivatives products that may be predicated on an underlying commodity, for example, oil, gold, or even Bitcoin futures contracts. Involved intermediaries are then subject to CFTC requirements, including with respect to registration, trade surveillance, and customer education and protection. Since 2018, the CFTC has overseen well-regulated, robust, and transparent Bitcoin futures and options markets. 
These products were offered under the CFTC's tailored heightened review framework in order to, in order to address unique digital commodity characteristics, including their high degree of retail participation and unique custody considerations. The CFTC accordingly established the basis for differential treatment of digital commodities and ensured that Americans have access to well-regulated markets. This outcome is far preferable to seeing investors lured to offshore illegal derivatives exchanges that are prone to fraud and financial crime. With respect to the SEC, it has broadly asserted its enforcement authority and suggested that many cryptocurrencies are securities. While many enforcement actions, especially during the ICO mania, targeted clear cases of an issuer selling tokens to raise capital or defraud investors, there remains a lack of clarity in determining when an asset is a security. This ambiguity has implications since market participants and regulators alike may struggle in determining which rules apply. Looking ahead, while some states like New York have developed mature regulatory frameworks, there is no current federal market regulator overseeing spot digital commodity markets. By statute, the CFTC is a principles-based regulator established by Congress to deter and prevent price manipulation, uphold market integrity, protect market participants, and promote responsible innovation. The CFTC, however, would need specific statutory authority to oversee spot digital commodity markets. Additionally, even if the CFTC were granted such authority, it would still be necessary to increase defi definitional clarity regarding when a token is or is not a security. This is an area where more work needs to be done, whether by the courts, regulators, or Congress. Today's panel, as well as many, uh, many others before us, have identified existing gaps and opportunities to create a more efficient and comprehensive national regulatory framework. Against this backdrop, I think there is a great opportunity for policymakers to work collaboratively to craft that framework in order to ensure the responsible development of digital assets and markets in the U.S. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Rivera, you're now recognized for five minutes for your oral presentation. Thank you, Chairman Hill and Ranking Member Lynch, uh, Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters, and the members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Joshua Rivera. I serve as general counsel of Blockchain Capital, a venture capital firm focused on digital assets technology. I'm a lawyer by training and practice and have represented traditional global financial institutions in various financial transactions, including capital markets, financings, mergers and acquisitions, and asset management. I also have the great privilege of sitting on our investment committee at Blockchain Capital and, and participating in the critical investment decisions we make on behalf of our limited partners. Blockchain Capital manages approximately $2 billion in assets and has invested in more than 100 portfolio companies, protocol teams, and projects in the digital assets industry. Our team fields approximately 1,500 proposal decks and pitches each year from entrepreneurs building in the industry, providing us with a unique macro perspective on industry developments. Thank you for allowing me to testify about the incredible opportunities, as well as the challenges, the digital assets industry presents to an innovative American marketplace. My message for you today is that the industry wants to work with you, the members of this subcommittee, other members of Congress, and regulators on developing appropriate market structure regulation for addressing the novel challenges and opportunities this technology presents. First, I'll explain pain points in our current financial system and how blockchain technology can enhance our society. The current financial system is overly reliant on centralized intermediaries. This is a paradigm that constrains innovation. The US consumer credit rating system provides a prime example of the inefficient and flawed systems that can arise out of overly intermediated value systems. Monopolized by three ratings bureaus, this system is often ineffective and exclude those who need safe and affordable access to credit, while also creating immense privacy and security concerns. It is not only legacy financial systems that suffer from intermediaries. Social media enterprises like Facebook and Twitter, as well as content, content platforms like Spotify and YouTube have all leveraged the free and instantaneous transfer of data originally pioneered by the, by the internet, not to democratize participation in value creation, but rather to monopolize it. They do this by commoditizing their own users and preventing actual content creators from realizing more value from the content they create. Blockchain technology creates alternative solutions to the services and infrastructure, in, infrastructure controlled by these intermediaries. 
In the case of financial ecosystems, blockchain networks can be accessed anywhere in the world by anyone with an internet connection. Using these networks, participants can transfer any amount of value to virtually any location in the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, with instantaneous settlement at much lower cost to the user. So the question is, how should we engage with this innovation? The fundamental innovation of blockchain networks is to allow anyone, anywhere, to participate in commerce or other systems of value without an intermediary. This is novel and a fundamental shift from the traditional ways in which finance and commerce are both organized and regulated. It requires a new approach. There's an unfortunate perception that participants, investors, and founders in the digital assets industry do not want to be regulated. This is false. A great number of participants, myself included, have sought over many years to engage with regulators in a collaborative attempt to set out clear and workable rules of the road. While there have been some rulemaking efforts, these efforts have not come early or often enough and unfortunately have been made with almost no meaningful industry engagement. The undesirable result has been rule proposals that are largely unworkable, both in technical implementation and policy outcomes. We should work with this innovation, not against it. According to data from PitchBook, the share of venture capital funding for blockchain startups in the European Union surpassed the allocation for US firms for the first time ever in the first quarter of this year. This may signal a potentially devastating outcome, one that the US may not be able to recover from. It's something that every member of this subcommittee should actively seek to correct. In closing, the world-changing innovations introduced by the digital assets industry have only scratched the surface of their potential. We are on the cusp of the next wave of technological change, but the United States must act quickly to ensure it develops here and not abroad. Tailored, fit-for-purpose rules for this nascent ecosystem are critical and must protect consumers while also promoting innovation. Industry stands ready to work with you on this balanced approach, ensuring that U.S. remains a leader, as it often is, in all vanguard fields of innovation, especially blockchain technology. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Seibelhorn. You are now recognized for five minutes for your presentation. Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, members of the subcommittee. Is your mic on, sir? Uh, I believe it is. Yeah, there oh, That's go. better. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Zach Zweihorn, and I'm a partner at the law firm of Davis Polk and Wardwell. My legal practice focuses on the regulation of securities of the securities markets, and in particular, laws and rules that govern the activity and conduct of market intermediaries, such as securities exchanges and broker dealers. I've worked with many industry members, both in traditional finance as well as those that are crypto native, to consider their digital asset activities and the potential securities law compliance obligations. It has been a challenging landscape to navigate due to the regulatory uncertainty and some legal dead ends. There's been much debate on the question of whether a particular digital asset is or should be considered to be a security. This is a critical question and one that Congress needs to clarify. But what I'd like to highlight today is that if a digital asset is a security, not only is its initial sale subject to registration, but secondary market trading must occur through a web of registered and regulated market intermediaries, brokers, dealers, exchanges, transfer agents, clearing agencies. We've all heard the sirens call the trading platforms should come in and register. It sounds enticingly attractive, but it's an oversimplification that conflates registration, which may theoretically be possible, with compliance, which really is not. Registration is not simply a matter of filling out forms and send, sending them in. Instead, it is a substantive exercise of showing the regulator how a firm's proposed activities will comply with the existing laws and rules. Because these existing laws and rules were designed for traditional securities such as debt and equity, Compliance for trading in digital asset securities is challenging or virtually impossible. To point out a couple of examples, under current rule, law and rules, a registered exchange can generally only facilitate trading in a security if that security is registered. Similarly, broker-dealers are prohibited from facilitating trading in a security unless the issuer has taken steps to register it or otherwise make certain disclosures. This results in a catch-22. An intermediary is required to register with the SEC in order to facilitate trading. But if it has registered with the SEC, it is prohibited from facilitating trading unless the issuer, somebody different than the intermediary that it can't control, has taken further steps and actions. As another example, in order for centralized trading platforms to operate, someone needs to hold securities for investors.
but SEC accounting and custody guidance has made it legally or economically infeasible for either banks or broker dealers to provide custody services for digital assets. So again, if a firm was to register, there would be no way for it to facilitate trading because there's nobody that can provide custody. In light of these and other challenges, absent a litany of exemptions or new guidance from the SEC, a digital asset securities that did seek to register with the SEC would have its application rejected. There are also differences in market structure that raise unnecessary legal challenges. Digital asset trading platforms operate under a model that allows end users to directly trade on the platform, with the platform maintaining custody of the, of the digital assets of the user, matching buyers and sellers, and settling transactions. This is different from how our traditional securities markets work, where separate firms provide exchange, brokerage services, and clearing. Because the securities laws and rules were developed to regulate the heavily intermediated structure that are already evolved in the securities market, that model has been baked into the laws. As a result, current law assumes that there will be a high level of intermediation, and it effectively requires intermediation if an asset is a security, regardless of whether new innovations mean that that model is not necessarily practical or better for investors. It may be, pos uh, it may be popular in the crypto community to blame the SEC for bringing enforcement actions while failing to adopt a regulatory regime that is compatible with digital assets. But the SEC is a creature of statute created by Congress in charge of administering the federal securities laws that Congress has adopted. While the SEC has authority to provide exemptions, wholesale changes and entirely new regulatory regimes should come from Congress and not from the Commission. The only real solution is for Congress to establish a regulatory framework under which digital asset market structure can exist, giving the SEC a mandate to implement and facilitate it. Congress has amended the laws to address changes to the securities market before. Congress could and should take the same approach today. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Professor Allen, you're now recognized for five minutes for your oral presentation. Thank you. Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the committee, thank you for invest inviting me to testify at today's hearing. My name is Hillary Allen, and I'm a professor of law at the American University Washington College of Law and the author of the book, Driverless Finance, Fintech, Fintech's Impact on Financial Stability. We're here to talk about regulation of the digital asset markets, and the other witnesses here have urged legislative and regulatory reform in order to let crypto business models thrive. The main point I would like to make today is to urge you to be very wary of peeling back laws designed to protect the public from harm. In my research, I've explored in detail the financial stability and investor harms associated with the crypto markets, and in connection with the latter, I'd like to read you a quote from Congress in 1933. During the post-war decade, some 50 billion of new securities were floated in the United States. Fully half or 25 billion worth of securities floated during this period have been proved to be worthless. These cold figures spell tragedy in the lives of thousands of individuals who invested their life savings, accumulated after years of effort, in these worthless securities. The flotation of such a mass of essentially fraudulent securities was made possible because of the complete abandonment by many underwriters and dealers in securities of those standards of fair, honest, and prudent dealing that should be basic to the encouragement of investment in any enterprise. Alluring promises of easy wealth were freely made with little or no attempt to bring to the investor's attention those facts essential to estimating the worth of any security. High pressure salesmanship rather than careful counsel was the rule in this most dangerous enterprise. I think this statement would resonate very much with those who've lost money with Celsius or FTX or any of the other failed crypto intermediaries. I believe it would also resonate with those exposed to the DeFi platform Terra Luna or any number of other DeFi scams. I read this statement here to illustrate how that with crypto, not much has changed since 1933. Of course, the technology used is different now, but technology is only a tool, and the impacts of any technology are inextricably intertwined with the people who use it. With crypto, the existence of blockchain technology does nothing to change the economic incentives of those deploying it, and those incentives have not changed significantly since 1933. The crypto industry often demands that lawmakers and regulators understand the intricacies of blockchain technology before creating or enforcing law or rules. But I would submit that the crypto industry needs to learn some basics about economics and finance before they argue that the rules shouldn't apply to them. If they understood even a little bit about economics and finance, they would understand that technological decentralization and decentralized economic control are two very different things. A system can have lots of nodes, 
but if someone controls a lot of those nodes, they will control the system. Now, of course, it's possible that some members of the crypto industry already do understand these things and their rhetoric about decentralization is entirely disingenuous because there is nothing economically decentralized about the crypto markets where we see concentrations of economic power that sometimes rival or exceed what we would see in traditional finance. The technological decentralization achieved through blockchain technology that is far less efficient than centralized systems has all been for naught. While I see little of value in blockchain technology, I want to make clear that enforcement of existing law is not incompatible with blockchain technology. It is entirely possible for a business using blockchain technology to comply with existing investor protection and financial stability regulation. However, for many crypto businesses, it may be true that existing regulation is incompatible with the economics of their business model, especially if their business model depends on doing things that we have learned over the years tend to harm people like a hedge fund that profits by trading against the customers of an affiliated exchange without those customers knowing, or an exchange that profits by commingling its own assets with customer, customer assets and then using those commingled assets to trade, or an issuer that profits by making up assets out of thin air at almost zero cost, engaging in some wash trades to inflate their market price, hyping the assets on social media, using them as collateral for loans, and then dumping them on unsuspecting investors. As my written testimony explains, Existing financial law and regulations are already well suited to dealing with these kinds of harms associated with crypto business models. We shouldn't dispense with those protections lightly in any circumstances, and we really shouldn't dispense with them for the sake of letting business models based on speculation and predation thrive and become too big to fail. Remember that laws make markets, and bespoke crypto legislation could create a market for business models that don't have enough utility to survive on their own. More robust enforcement of existing laws and regulations would certainly be desirable. In particular, Congress should support the SEC's enforcement and securities registration and broker-dealer registration requirements with increased funding and with increased public, political support. But the legal fundamentals are by and large there. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we'll now turn to member questions, and the chair recognizes himself for five minutes for questioning. And I'll just start out by saying that I appreciate, Professor Allen, your talk about uh, the securities markets, and I think you've made many, many good points. Let me say that uh, between, you know, uh, March of 2000 and October of 2002, inside a regulatory framework with all the surveillance and people involved overseeing it and following every 33 and 34 Act, we lost five and a half trillion dollars from investors in the United States. Silicon Valley Bank, just a few weeks ago, super regulated, over regulated, massively regulated, but inside a regulatory framework. But due to lack of supervision and a terrible business uh, policy, uh, people lost a lot of money there. So what we're talking about today is crafting a regulatory framework that is fit for purpose and that fits the activity and absolutely doesn't undercut any fraud anything whatsoever about consumer or investor compliance. So I don't think anybody here is suggesting that. No one on this panel supports fraud, misbehavior, uh, lack of compliance, not following the rules, uh, et cetera. But we definitely have the need for a regulatory framework that fits the purpose and protects investors to the best that federal regulation can. Um, Although some digital assets will fall under the definition of a security or a commodity, and we've heard testimony today about both, such, uh, there are digital assets like a digital sports card or a digital collectible, or maybe a token connected to uh, an activity like a game or file, file coin that we've had descript that uh, described today pretty thoroughly, I think, that makes a use case for precisely what that company is doing that are distinguishable from a security or a commodity. And these assets being merit, in my view, being classified in a third category altogether, which is why the existing regulatory framework does not work. So, Mr. Gorefine, would you agree that there is a third bucket of uh, digital assets that need oversight, need clarity, uh, need all the investor and security protections, but they don't fit in the bucket of either Mr. Rivera's background at CFTC or Chair Gensler's world at the SEC. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I, and I would actually suggest that the problem with the term digital asset is it's incredibly broad. And I would say we have even more than three buckets. The reason I say that is you can effectively tokenize any asset, especially if you're tokenizing the ownership interest in that asset. So you could tokenize car title. You could tokenize title to a home. You could tokenize an actual item of digital art or ownership over existing artwork. So I think we have to be careful because the reality is, is that regulation looks at things through the lens of what type of an asset or an instrument is it, and we apply certain rules based on what the asset actually is. So in that sense, the term digital asset is incredibly broad, and there certainly may be items, collectibles, um, that fall outside of at least the securities law definition, and potentially even the way that the CFTC, for example, would view commodity, because the term commodity under the Commodity Exchange Act is incredibly broad. That doesn't mean that the CFTC is seeking to at least police the spot market for every conceivable commodity or instrument that can, uh, can transact in society. I like, so it's a broad I like, topic. Thank you. I, I like the idea of uh, either a gaming company that raises money to create a new game. Let's say they have to raise $10 million to create a game. That's clearly a security. It's a Reg D private placement to create the game. But if you invest in the game, uh, you also get uh, some tokens that are going to be used in the game if the game ever works. If the game is unveiled and nobody comes to play and it's a flop, then those are useless. But if the game's up and running a year later, those tokens have value. Are those tokens securities or are those tokens just things in the game? So that's where we're going to need some clarity around the potential for something to, to transition from being in one state, maybe down the line, to something else. If yep. people purchase a token in order to help the company raise money yep. with the no, expectation. No, that's not, of, but that wasn't my example. Right. This is something that's actually being used at functionally within the game. Yeah. So and another, that, make it, we'll dumb it down and make it even, uh, you know, for a broader audience, perhaps. $10 million to create the new musical. You're going to star in it on Broadway. And if the musical goes from off-Broadway to Broadway and is successful, everybody who put $100,000 in my $10 million offering gets 25 tickets to the show that they can use for the whole run of the show. So clearly a security. The Broadway show's a success. Uh, I'm earning a return on my investment, I hope. But I now have 25 tickets that are just a thing to go to this show. I can keep them, I can give them to my kids, I could sell them. Is, are those tickets a security? And it sounds like it's a, it's a perk as being part of that. A perk, thing. yeah, it's, a, it's an offshoot Award. of it. And if the play was a flop, then those would have no value. So uh, I think this is why we need to really carefully think about this. I appreciate the questions. Now let me yield to my friend, the ranking member, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Allen, uh, the SEC first warned investors of the dangers of investing in crypto back in 2013 when the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy issued an investor alert on, quote, Ponzi schemes involving cryptocurrencies, close quote. Then in 2014, the same office issued another investor alert on Bitcoin and other virtual currency related investments. In 2019, the SEC issued a, quote, Framework on Investment Contract Analysis of Digital Assets. And that was to provide clarity on when a digital asset has the characteristic of a security and when a sale of a digital asset is a securities transaction. And in addition, there have been 130 enforcement actions brought by the SEC against crypto firms that have engaged in marketing securities without providing the necessary disclosures audited financials or investor protections that would allow investors to make a meaningful and informed decision regarding the value of crypto product or the viability of the underlying business. Two points are notable. One, the SEC has won every single one of those 130 cases that they have brought under existing law. And two, each of those cases went through a legal process which culminated in every case a written regulatory decision, and many had judicial decisions or administrative opinions written on appeal that actually do provide clear and unambiguous guidance to the crypto industry and provide clarity and lay out the rules of the road that should guide other crypto firms. So the claims that there's no direction, there's no clarity, uh, and, and 
at least that part of it. Can you, can you speak to that? Well, I do think it's quite clear, and it ties back to the investor harms that I mentioned earlier. The Howey test is all about protecting people who've invested their money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profits to come predominantly from the efforts of others. That offers scope for harm, and I think that probably accurately reflects why most people are investing in these crypto things. I think there is the clarity, but if we wanted more, Congress could pass legislation that inserted uh, crypto assets into the definition of security in both the 33 Act and the 34 Act, and that would settle it for all time. Let me ask you, the fact that, uh, and, and others have said here this morning that you could basically uh, tokenize anything. Uh, if, if you did have a system for crypto that was, that didn't, so all those rules that apply to traditional finance don't apply, okay, because they're all acting right now in non-compliance. If, if there's another whole system that is set up where there's no, re, uh, no compliance requirements for disclosure or commingling of funds, which is happening rampantly in the crypto world, what would that do to the traditional finance system where you have, you know, financial firms that are under the burden and, and have to observe the protections that are provided to investors and, and to, uh, to the public? This is really important. A bespoke crypto regime would be a massive regulatory loophole for all of financial services. I don't actually use the term digital assets in this space because I think all our assets are already digital. Right, so I talk about crypto um, as being something that is associated with the blockchain because all our assets are already digital. It's very easy, as we've heard, to tokenize them and put them on the blockchain. So if you create a special bespoke crypto regime that has l fewer protections than the existing regulatory regime, it doesn't take a genius to see what's gonna happen to, tradi to traditional finance. They're gonna put it all on the blockchain and take advantage of that lighter touch regime. Right, and, and would, uh, so with the commingling of funds, many of the crypto firms, they don't provide audited financials, they don't make those necessary disclosures. Um, if, if we applied all of the, well, if we, if we held the crypto industry to the same standards, would that, would that be one way of, of legitimizing or protecting the public even in the uh, crypto realm. Yeah, that's right. We've got to thread the needle where we protect the public without giving you know, special treatment to crypto. And I think by applying existing registration requirements for the securities themselves and also for um, the broker-dealer regulation and exchange regulation, um, just to take one example, that would mean that the current crypto exchange model with all of the conflicts of interest that is just rife in that model couldn't, couldn't continue to exist, and so customers would be protected from all of those conflicts of interest by requiring those exchanges to register. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank my friend. Now I'll turn to Mr. Rose of Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hill, and, and thank you, Ranking Member Lynch, for holding the hearing, and thank you to our distinguished uh, witnesses for being here and sharing your time with us. Mr. Rivera, AI-linked blockchain products include payment systems, trading models, machine-generated non-fungible tokens, and blockchain-based marketplaces for AI applications. As we think through how to play catch-up in the broader crypto regulatory landscape, what are some of the unique regulatory gaps created by AI-linked crypto projects? So the, the question on AI is a, is a difficult one. It's still a very burgeoning and growing industry. It's, it's moving extremely rapidly with the recent rise of chat, chat GBT. Um, its application to crypto is something that we are looking at very closely uh, and how that will be regulated I think is extremely important, but I think the, the, the focus needs to be on regulating entities that we understand how they work, intermediaries, right, exchanges, custodians, um, who provide services in a centralized way to the digital asset ecosystem, uh, and making sure that that regulation is focused and not so broad that it stifles innovation for things that we understand less, like how AI is going to interplay with digital assets in the next three to five years. Uh, there surely will be a, a, a large number of innovations that will come from the interplay of those two things, 
uh, and many of them will be extremely useful. They will be extremely beneficial to society, and we should give space for those innovations to happen. Um, and in the meantime, really focus on providing uh, targeted regulation for entities that we understand. Thank you. Shifting, Mr. Gorfine, at the SEC, Chair Gensler has insisted that digital assets' legal status depends on, quote, individual facts and circumstances, unquote, and that projects should, quote, come in and talk to the SEC, close quote, to identify a path towards compliance. Only about four crypto projects have been able to come into compliance as defined by the SEC. Mr. Gorfine, at your former agency, the CFTC, is there a path towards compliance specifically for exchanges, and what does that look like? Yeah, so, so to level set, remember that spot commodities are not directly regulated by the CFTC. So exchanges that are engaging in spot or cash trading activity do not register with the CFTC. But the CFTC has registered and oversees a number of exchanges that do offer Bitcoin or Ether futures and options products, and those can be both physically settled and cash settled. So there is a robust, well-regulated marketplace regulated by the CFTC where registrants have been able to come in and offer those types of products. Thank you. Mr. Zweihorn, uh, Chair Gensler has said, and I'm going to give you about four of his quotes, the SEC needs additional authorities to prevent transactions, products, and platforms from falling between regulatory cracks in August of 2021. In December of 2022, he said that he feels that the SEC has enough authority in this space. In May of 21, he said that right now there is not a market regulator for crypto exchange changes, exchanges. And then in December of 22, he said that exchanges can come into compliance by appropriately working with the SEC. So, Mr. Zweihorn, do you believe that these comments provide regulatory clarity and promote stability in digital markets? Thank you, Congressman Rose. Um, you know, I think those comments, depending on whether he's referring to a digital asset that is a security or that is not a security, could mean different things. Um, it is, there is a lot of lack of clarity about that, but the SEC admittedly, by its own admission, doesn't regulate Bitcoin or Bitcoin exchanges. So I don't think he could mean that Bitcoin uh, exchanges would need to register, but as he has said, he believes, and the market does not agree with this, that many other digital assets are securities. Uh, but there is certainly some lack of clarity in terms of which ones and therefore what obligations that they have. Thank you. Mr. Rivera, SEC Commissioner's Purse has, has noted, SEC Commissioner Purse has noted that there has been a reluctance on the part of the SEC to quote, provide additional guidance about how to determine whether a token is being sold as part of the securities office offering or which tokens are securities, close quote. In your view, would additional guidance from the SEC on this issue be helpful? Yeah, I think it's pretty telling when one of the commissioners of the SEC has, has directly stated that there's reticence in the agency to provide guidance. Um, we've been asking for this with the SEC for a long time. As they say, everything is facts and circumstances. So it's hard to say that whether something is a security is based on facts and circumstances, but everything is a security. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. And now my friend from Illinois, Dr. Foster, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Belcher, um, how does Filecoin handle anonymity and censorship? Uh, for example, if someone steals the designs of nuclear weapons and posts them on Filecoin, uh, can you find out who did it, um, remove the material, and take, down, take it down and uh, identify the person? Thank you so much for that question. Um, so Filecoin is an open source technology, and so many people are building tools on top of the Filecoin network. No, my question is, can you do it today? As it's set up right now, if someone tomorrow posts the design of nuclear weapons, can you identify the person, haul them into court, and remove the material? Yes, so we have content moderation tools that have, are built on top of the Filecoin network. Um, and by... you have a governance structure that, that allows you, let's say that the taking down material is disputed. What court system do you go to to resolve that? So the way that it works is basically the same content moderation rules Which apply. Which court system ultimately has jurisdiction? So the, again, the same rules that would apply to no, content. Are you saying no court system has jurisdiction to ultimately decide if there's a disputed uh, takedown of material? 
I'm seeing the same rules apply uh, to content moderation on the Filecoin network as apply to Facebook or any other, uh, any other protocol. So you go to, so what jurisdiction are you registered, is the mothership registered in that allows the court to say, I'm sorry, I order you to take that down? Uh, so it's not, a, just like with Facebook, there isn't registration for content moderation. Uh, the way that it works is you can go to any individual uh, node or storage provider, and we actually have tools that provide for decentralized content moderation. Okay. Um, all right, that's an important question that we have to think through because it will happen and maybe already has. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Gorfine. Um, there are estimates uh, from Forbes and other places that more than 50% of all Bitcoin transactions are fakes, mostly wash trades between anonymous participants. And so how can you possibly have a well-regulated market in, say, Bitcoin futures when the majority of transactions in the underlying assets are fraudulent? So when the CFTC allowed the self-certification of Bitcoin futures, it did so under a heightened review framework where there were requirements for the, the derivatives exchanges to have information sharing relationships with the underlying exchanges being used to but, create But there are a lot of price. trades that are not on underlying exchanges. How do you get the information to know that this is a wash trade? So, so the underlying exchanges were US-based exchanges participating in the index formation, but to your point, that's the gap in the underlying spot market is there is no federal market supervision of spot trading activity as you would typically see with market regulation. Right, so yeah, so for trading derivatives, you need a trader ID. So you know exactly who, the, there's a regulator that sees the true identity of both participants of all trades and they can identify wash trades and other market abuses. That, 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 that's, that's right. That's and not present in Bitcoin. Correct. That's right. And the, the same is the case, though, for many other commodities. Precious metals, like gold-based futures, you don't have spot markets tend to operate differently than regulated markets. But in the context of digital commodities, there are these characteristics around the trading activity, the retail-facing aspect, which could warrant this much, type of market Which are much more surveilled than uh, Bitcoin is, I guess, the point. Um, and Mr. Rivera, um, one of the fundamental rules of the road is that you cannot drive a car on the road without a license plate and without a licensed driver. I mean, the automobile industry would never have gone anywhere without that, that convention. And for the same reason, it seems to me that all crypto wallets must require a visible driver's license, a verifiable driver's license that can be anonymous under most circumstances, but when a crime has been committed, you have to use that to de-anonymize the true owner. Um, in addition, if we, if for, for commodities or any item which has a market-defined value, we have to prevent wash trades and other front-running market abuses like that. So is there any alternative in this case to have a regulator somewhere that sees the true identity between all participants of all crypto transactions? Is there any alternative to that? So we're investing in companies that are building something called zero knowledge. Is there technology. one? I, I understand there's a dream. Is there anything that works today um, for, for, um, that will allow you to, to prevent wash trades, for example? So uh, crypto uh, networks are extremely transparent, and federal regulators actually no, prefer, but there are, there are ones yeah. where they're deliberate effort, like Monero and more advanced, that are, where they're deliberate and very effective efforts to make it impossible to identify the true participants. Now, so the question is, is there, does the technology exist today to prevent wash trades unless there is a regulator that sees the true identity? I mean, if you can respond, my time's out, but if you can yeah, respond. Yeah, it's developing, sir. If, yeah. I understand, but the question for everyone, in which I'd like to respond in the record, does the technology exist today that does not require having a regulator see the true identities uh, behind, um, you know, behind both sides of any crypto transaction if we wish to prevent wash trades and other market abuses? Thank infancy. you. My time's up. I yep. If you'd respond in writing if you'd like to on that. Thank you very much. Uh, the Vice Chairman of the Digital Assets Subcommittee and the Chairman of the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee, Mr. Davidson of Ohio, is recognized for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. I thank our witnesses. Um, I thank my colleagues who are taking time to continue to study this issue uh, as someone who's tried to get regulatory clarity for this since I got on the committee in 2017. It's been painful. You just see people ask questions that you explain over and over and over and over and over again. And that's why it means a lot that people do take time to understand the issue. Uh, it seems that we, even then, you will have people that draw different conclusions. 
like the only reason you would want to own these things is to evade the law. Uh, the reality is people have been pleading for this ever since I got here, ever since the ICO market. People with good use cases have come here saying, please solve this problem. Uh, they're asking to be regulated, and not the way a lot of people are being asked to regulate it. They're saying basically, hey, could you protect our market share by making it illegal for people to actually compete with us? They're saying, let's compete. I think the challenge is people think of, of the space uh, in the same, if they can't get rid of Bitcoin altogether, uh, they at least want to make it account-based because they don't actually trust you with custody. It, just like they haven't actually outlawed cash, but almost, right? So, um, Mr. Rivera, as you're aware, the markets and crypto assets regulation that was passed in the European Union recently, which puts them well ahead of us, they actually passed a law. But alongside this proposal, the EU also passed a, a transfer of funds regulations which imposes strict uh, know your customer regime whenever more than 1,000 euro is transferred between self-custody wallets. I, if I move more than $1,000 of value to someone else in any form, cash or something of worth, you gotta get a third party. We don't trust our citizens. They can't do uh, permissionless transactions. Everything's gotta be permissioned. It seems like some of my colleagues actually think that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's kind of dystopian personally, but the reality is, how do you have DeFi without the D part, the decentralized? Yeah, so the transfer of funds rule is the European Union's effort to uh, clarify the existing travel rule. I think um, you know, the rule itself is not perfect, but importantly what it does is it limits the application of the rule to institutions, institutions communicating with each other and making transfers of value to each other. While doing so, it aims to protect the privacy of individuals who want to self-custody their assets. So the, the objective of the rule is to actually allow individuals to participate in decentralized systems without having to divulge personal information about themselves and the financial activities that they engage in while still regulating institutions that send that information like our travel rule. It's, uh, you know, it's unclear how it's gonna be implemented as it has just been passed, but it, it, it does make the right efforts, at least initially. So, um, you know, that's encouraging and it's a little more narrow than, than I had understood it to be, uh, if, if not in law, in intent maybe. But um, I guess how important is custody to the concept of market structure. So when some of the same people in the room helped in 2018 craft what became the base text for the 100% bipartisan token taxonomy act, we wanted to define a bright line test that translates the Howey test into language um, that people can understand, including the regulators. Um, but it also dealt with custody. So, uh, you know, we, we have custody challenges in our T plus two trading of actual securities, but you, since you have a real time 24 seven, in theory, permissionless peer to peer transaction capability, how important is custody to market structure? And I'll open that up to the panel. Well, custody is extremely important. Um, and it's extremely important to understand the differences between traditional custody, which is paper based and, and ledger based and relies on an intermediary that is keeping track uh, and digital assets custody, which um, actually relies on a decentralized blockchain to uh, identify who has what. Um, in order to ensure protection of, of client funds under a custodial regime, digital asset custodians have to have incredible technical expertise, and it's technical expertise that they have developed over the course of the last 10 years. Can more um, than one person have custody of something at the same time? No, but uh, someone can have, someone can gain access to funds uh, in the same way that someone could kind of steal funds in a bank. But the way you do that is very different. Right. Now, I think the important point when you look at, at some of the markets where you'll see asymmetry in um, naked short selling and derivatives contracts and so on and so forth, the idea is really solved with the custody rules here. I wish I had longer to go into this. My time has expired and I yield back.
I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres. Is thank you, Mr. Chair. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if the United States continues driving crypto offshore, there will be more offshore companies, more companies in the offshore deregulated mold of FTX. And so it seems to me it would be in the interest of consumer and investor protection to bring crypto into a workable but rigorous regulatory regime here in the United States. Uh, FTX fraud has no greater friend than the status quo, no greater friend than congressional inertia. New York State has shown that it is possible to create a rigorous regulatory regime for crypto without causing the apocalypse for nine decades of securities law. So there's the question of whether Congress should create a new regulatory framework for crypto as New York State has successfully done, or whether Congress should seek to fit crypto within the existing federal framework for regulating financial assets, which strikes me as the more probable outcome. If Congress elects to adapt the existing framework rather than create an entirely new one, the question then becomes which digital assets qualify as securities and which qualify as commodities or something else. But if an asset qualifies as security, then there's a the question of registration. And that's where, the, where blockchain technology has run into a buzzsaw. Even if Congress were to pass a law that provides perfect regulatory clarity as to which assets are securities, none of it matters if there's no workable path to registration and compliance. And under the status quo, SEC registration is little more than a mirage for blockchain businesses. The number of blockchain businesses that have found a workable path to registration is close to zero. Uh, one observer put it cogently, quote, the SEC has created a world where project founders are required to register as ice cream while making freezers illegal. Good luck. So my question to Mr. Sweehorn, how can Congress best tailor registration to accommodate blockchain technology without compromising investor protection? Thank you, Congressman Torres. Um, I think that's a very good way of thinking about it. My clients certainly, and nobody I know that's you know, respectable in the blockchain space, believes that it should be unregulated, that we need fewer regulations we want, uh, that they want a, um, a system that sort of gives them an, an out. I think they want tailored regulations. Uh, as I said in my testimony, there are a lot of SEC rules and part of the federal securities laws that are sort of a round peg and square hole when it comes to digital assets because they're just different. And if you compare the white papers that came out during the ICO boom and compare them to a prospectus, they're obviously a lot shorter, there's a lot less information, but there's also a lot of information that is not in uh, SEC prospectuses because digital asset purchasers have interests in other topics that are not ones that the SEC in its forms have asked, has, have asked about. And, but, and if, as I understand, Mr. Gensler himself has said that the SEC has tailored disclosure requirements to accommodate the particularities of industry. So there's nothing unprecedented about the notion of tailoring. That, that's, yes, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. That, that's correct. The SEC has adopted particularized disclosure regimes for certain assets. Uh, they've not done so at the moment for digital asset okay. securities. Uh, the SEC statutorily is designed to be a merit neutral regulator, uh, but it hardly requires a suspension of disbelief to imagine a regulator who has a personal or ideological antipathy for crypto and therefore seeks to regulate the industry out of existence. But even if you're a critic of crypto, the fact remains that regulatory sabotage of crypto is the antithesis of merit neutral regulation, which is the kind of regulation that Congress contemplated for the SEC. So how can Congress ensure that the SEC is in fact a merit neutral regulator and how do you prevent the use of the registration process to punish or sabotage an industry that has fallen out of political favor. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to impugn the motives of anybody at the SEC. They're hardworking and good meaning and are, I think, acting in good faith. Uh, but they are subject to the securities laws. Congress has mandated that they apply the securities laws as Congress has written them. I think a, you know, they, they ha their incentive is to make sure that the securities laws are followed as at least they interpret them. I think if Congress uh, wanted to make it more likely that there would be a workable path, uh, Congress would need to mandate that the SEC adopt something that is actually um, functional and possible for, uh, for the market to comply with. Uh, and a, a distinction's been drawn between regulating financial activity and regulating the technology that underlies the activity. Some people call it regulating applications versus regulating protocols. 
when crafting a regulatory framework, how should we think about that distinction? Should financial regulators be limited to their core competency of regulating financial activity rather than the underlying technology? Of course, you know, the one challenge with digital assets, as I think Mr. Gordfein said earlier, is that you can have a car title, you can have a home title, an NFT or a security or a commodity, and they're all a digital asset of some sort or another. And I think, you know, we in this country do regulate different items and different assets differently depending on what the risks are because the risks of buying a house are different than the risks of buying a security. Uh, so there would need to be a way to differentiate in terms of whether this asset is an investment product. It is really Gentleman's exists. time has expired. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Timmons is recognized for five minutes. Hey, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for taking time to come testify before us here today. Uh, in 1946, the justices of the United States Supreme Court could not have fathomed the internet, no less digital assets. It seems absurd that the future of digital assets will be decided using such an archaic test. Nevertheless, the Howey test has dominated the conversation around how to classify digital assets. Uh, Mr. Zweihorn, can you talk to any other classification frameworks that exist? Well, a, a case subsequent to Howey, um, the Foreman case, questioned whether a share of stock in a co-op, uh, a residential apartment co-op, uh, was a security, and the court said, well, somebody, a co-op is used to live in. There's a functional purpose for it, and if something has a functional purpose, and it's not just an investment, then it's, it's not a security. So there is this tension there, particularly with digital assets, of whether the asset is just an investment or it actually has a functional purpose, such as, as Filecoin that uh, other, other members of the panel has talked about. What suggestions would you have if we were to create a test from scratch to classify digital assets? I mean, it's a challenging question, Congressman, because a lot of these assets are dual purpose. And while Filecoin, as an example, um, is useful and has utility to use for purchasing storage space, there are plenty of people that speculate on it. But that's true with lots of commodities. People buy gold as an investment. People buy property as an investment. Uh, I think there has to be some kind of threshold for utility where if this thing actually is just a share of an interest in a company uh, and it's a claim on its debt or equity, then it is a security. And if there's actual utility, then it's not. Thank you for that. Uh, turning back to Howie, uh, Mr. Rivera, can you talk about the need for a definition for when a digital asset is or has become sufficiently decentralized to fall out of Howie? Uh, how should we think about this? Yeah, that's a very good question. It, it's going to take a lot of collaboration from Congress to think through principles-based legislation that will allow regulators to make specific applications uh, in, in, for, di for different assets. Um, facts and circumstances isn't incorrect, um, like the SEC likes to say, uh, but it does mean that we need to have uh, more principled legislative approaches to make that determination. There are thousands of digital assets. Some of them are securities, many of them are not. Um, and understanding the ways in which they're used, whether they have a use case, um, understanding uh, both the technical and the economic decentralization in the networks that they operate on, those are key principles that Congress really needs to understand well and think about implementing. Um, and so it's going to take some time and require collaboration. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Belcher, what about when blockchain technology is used, say, in a business-to-business -business process solution? I've met with many companies who are utilizing blockchain technology to trim hours, and in some cases days, off of B2B processes in the financial services world. Uh, the efficiency and cost savings presented by these companies is incredibly compelling. Uh, are there any risks of getting in the way of blockchain innovation by not considering this important use of blockchain technology while we're working on market structure legislation? Absolutely. Um, you know, Filecoin is really just one example of so many protocols that are enabling a huge number of businesses, including small businesses, to thrive. Um, for example, many of our thousands of storage providers are small businesses in the United States. Um, in fact, as one example, Lucky Storage actually converted a former Lucky Strike tobacco factory in North Carolina into a data storage facility. They're actually here today. Um, they have 65 employees in North Carolina. That's one of thousands of storage providers on just one 
cryptocurrency network. And in addition, we have many applications that are built on top of the Filecoin network that are business to business and that also are sm themselves small businesses. Um, one example is Audius. Um, I mentioned in my testimony the ability to say for every second of a song I play, automatically transfer a millionth of a cent to the songwriter. And they're actually doing that, building on top of the Filecoin network. So these are things that are really revolutionizing um, the way that small businesses work. And it's very important not to get in the way of that innovation in order to ensure that these businesses continue to thrive. Thank you for that. One final question. Uh, Ms. Belcher, just broadly speaking, do you believe that blockchain technology can deliver on the industry's promise of efficiency, decent decentralization, and financial inclusion? Absolutely. Um, all you have to do is think about what happened within hours of Russia invading Ukraine. Within hours, Ukraine had posted their wallet address, and millions and millions of dollars were donated via cryptocurrency. Why? Because it was the most efficient way to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now I yield uh, to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. Tens of billions of dollars have been transferred to Ukraine using traditional currencies. And lots of money has gone to Russia evading our sanctions using cryptocurrency. Um, fear of, moving, of missing out. Somebody else may get ahead of us in this technology. The Bahamas is ahead of us. Um, Peru is ahead of us in cocaine cultivation. China is ahead of us in organ harvesting. And the Cayman Islands is ahead of us in financial crime. We don't need to catch up. Fentanyl is a new innovative technology. We don't need a regulatory system that rewards those who created that innovation. There are gaps in our regulatory system because Congress fails to pass a law prohibiting Americans from buying cryptocurrency. There are gaps in our law because we have not, uh, in the alternative, passed a law saying that cryptocurrency is clearly a security. So we're going to leave it to the courts to decide based on the Howey test. And there are gaps because the crypto industry cannot prosper unless much of it is underwater immune from the know your currency, know your customer anti-money laundering statutes. That doesn't mean everybody who invests in cryptocurrency is trying to hide money, although cryptocurrency means hidden money. Sometimes they think they can just make a profit investing in cryptocurrency and selling it to someone else uh, who needs to hide their money. Just as you can make money by investing in a burglary, burglary tool factory without actually being a burglar. Sam Bankman Freed is out on bail, unfortunately, living in my state much better than most of my constituents. But his ghost is still in this room. He haunts the halls of Rayburn, but let's remember why he was here. For one reason to prevent the SEC from having jurisdiction over cryptocurrency and to give cryptocurrency the baby regulation, the patina of regulation that would be provided through the uh, CFTC. If you want to know whether, it, uh, whether crypto is a currency uh, or whether crypto is uh, a security, just ask yourself, are those in the crypto business engaged in the financial services business or the agriculture business? Um, it's clear that they want the agriculture uh, committee regulator uh, on this to provide a patina of regulation. All of the money and power in this town is in the hey pro crypto side because crypto bros make money literally by making money and they've made over a trillion dollars out of thin air. Um, they'll accuse the U.S. government of making money out of thin air. Maybe we do, but we're the U.S. government. What we're able to do benefits the American people in a democratic system. Nobody elected Sam Bankman Freed. Um, but I want to pursue one other area, and that is taxation. We have this capital gains allowance. Very low tax, or if you hold it till you die, no tax on your gain. And we justify that on the basis uh, that uh, we're trying to encourage people to invest 
in something that will create jobs and build the American economy. Uh, Professor Allen, can you think of a reason why we allow gains on cryptocurrency, when they're ever reported, uh, to be taxed uh, under a favorable rate, a lower uh, tax rate than is paid by our staff? So I think you've hit on something important in all your remarks, which is that we're talking about crypto as something that it isn't actually. So let me demystify the blockchain a little bit. A blockchain is a database, right? That's what it is. It has no magical powers. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes it a blockchain is that there is no quote unquote centralized technolog technological node that controls that database, who updates it, et cetera. But there are economic forces that centralize control of that database. And so we've created something that is really replicating what we already have. Now, I'm not an apologist for traditional finance. There's a lot of problems with traditional mm -hmm. finance. But what we have here is all of those problems being replicated or exacerbated. And so when we talk about sort of giving capital gains treatment or tailored regulation, et cetera, to this space, we have to ask the question, why are we doing this? Traditional finance, with all its flaws, facilitates capital formation and credit allocation. Crypto does neither. And so I think we need to keep that in mind as we think about how we regulate this space. Thank you. I thank the gentleman who yields back. And now Ms. Houchin is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Lynch. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to the witnesses, and thank you for being here. Um, I want to uh, talk, as been, has been mentioned today, about um, FinHub's guidance. In 2019, the SEC's FinHub uh, released guidance regarding how an issuer of a digital asset can determine whether it would fall under the definition of an investment contract and thus be required to comply with securities laws. The guidance consists of a list of factors and sub-factors that digital asset projects should consider. Uh, Mr. Zweihorn, in your view, is this guidance useful for projects in determining whether or not they'll be classified as a security by the SEC? Thank you for the question. I think when the guidance first came out, uh, the industry was very excited to have some guidance. Um, and it was useful in terms of showing what the SEC was thinking, and a good faith effort by the SEC to tell the industry that. But in time, it has turned out to not be all that helpful. It consists of 50 plus factors, none of which is determinative. It's a, it's a question of weighing and therefore resulting in how likely something will be. So it, it leaves people sort of not with a definitive answer on you know, any particular token that they're considering. So as a follow-up to that, how does a purchaser determine how many factors it needs to meet and how to weigh the factors against each other under this current structure? Uh, it's a difficult question. There, there, you know, a colleague of mine referred to it as a ruler with no lines. Uh, so you can't really tell where on the ruler you are. You kind of get a feeling of how many factors and how important those factors are, but there's not a way to answer that. Uh, during Chairman Ginsler's term, has the SEC provided any other guidance on how the commission will determine whether a digital asset is offered as part of an investment contract? Uh, the chairman and the commission, I'm not aware of putting out further guidance as such. The chairman obviously speaks his mind uh, openly uh, before Congress and in other venues. Uh, and the SEC has brought a number of enforcement actions where uh, the SEC in sets out its view of whether particular assets are or not securities and explains it to some degree. They haven't turn back to the framework in those enforcement actions, as far as I'm aware, to evaluate it against the framework. And in some ways, some of the enforcement actions of late have been inconsistent with the framework, where the enforcement actions as this asset was sold as a security initially many, many years ago, whereas the framework looks to what is it today? What, is it use, what are its uses today? Um, is it decentralized? So there's been a bit of a shift in thinking, it looks like. What has been, um, in your opinion, the result of the SEC's failure to provide guidance on this issue? I mean, it's very challenging for members of the industry and clients of mine because they really are at the whim of, are they going to get an enforcement action if they do something here? They can have very strong views, uh, very strong legal views, opinions or guidance from counsel, but at the end of the day, if they're doing anything in this space, they're they have to worry that the regulator may disagree with them. So um, switching gears a little bit here, one of the problems with the current regulatory framework is that 
digital asset projects have a dis disincentive to register as they're less likely to be listed on a trading platform if they are classified as a security. Uh, Mr. Zweihorn, would you discuss the perverse incentives that this dynamic creates and how our market structure legislation can ensure that firms are not penalized for complying with the law? Yeah, so I think the firms that are not listing on exchanges are not doing so because they don't believe that the asset involved is a security. Uh, and the disincentive is that if the asset is a security, those exchanges which are not registered with the SEC would not list it. So if they want to have a liquid market for the asset, they need to take steps to ensure that in their view, they are comfortable that it is not a security. The SEC may or may not, may not, may or may not agree with that. Um, because if it is a security, it won't be listed. I think market structure regulation would need to create a viable market structure where either if uh, it defines that these if that defines that these are securities, make it so that exchanges can actually list them, which they really can't today, or if it defines them as not securities, creates a market structure where exchanges can exist uh, that do list them and trade them in a way that consumers are protected. Okay, thank you. Um, from the financial sector to alternative uses and applications, digital assets and the underlying technologies are here to stay. It's important we create clear rules of the road to stop the threat of regulation by enforcement and establish a field where anyone who wants to play by the rules has the ability to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Castens, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thanks to all our witnesses. Um, Ms. Belcher, I want to um, start with, when, in your testimony, you described um, some of your customers as being musicians who, you know, you've got a trend, you know, put it on Spotify or something like that, um, uh, and get paid in fraction, you know, fractions of a penny for every listen. Um, the, and I want to first say that I completely agree there's an enormous value of the blockchain te technology, you know, distributed ledger, as a way to monetize the, the digital asset. Um, you said fractions of a cent, which is not a cryptocurrency. For people who are engaging in that transaction, is, are what, is what they're putting on the blockchain essentially an invoice to be repaid in US currency, or is it an invoice to be repaid in a token that is separate from the dollar? I just, I just didn't quite follow from how you explained that distinction. Thank you for the question. Uh, it is a token, but uh, the okay. point I was trying to make is that it can be micro, micro amounts. No, 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 sure. Why? Why is it a token? Because I don't, I don't have any need for rapid settlement of, of three-tenths of a penny. Sure. Um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, that enables us to program money, to send it instantly and automatically across the world with no intermediary, as though I'm handing a fraction of a cent to so someone. It's, so it's primary a settlement time issue. So that so it's a programmability issue. No, but I could I could program an invoice. If you and I have a if I, I want to have a legal contract that you owe me money, I could program and have a blockchain that you owe me money. Yeah. Right? So um, basically, to give you an example from Filecoin, it's important that we use a bespoke token as opposed to a stable coin or uh, the traditional financial system because that is actually what allows us to operate the way that the Filecoin token does operate. Okay, we're, we're, we're gonna get wonkier here than we have time for, but it, it seems to me that a token could be an invoice that is dollar denominated. I don't have to re-tokenize. And the reason that I, the reason that I mentioned that I'd like to, Mr. Chairman, I think I'd like to enter for the record an article from this last week's New Yorker called Crook's Mistaken Bet on Encrypted Phones. Without objection. I would encourage everybody to read this article because it's fascinating. It has nothing and everything to do with crypto. It's essentially a lot of our international financial regulators hacked into the bad guys' cell phones that they thought were encrypted and have unearthed these massive financial fraud networks where you can go take a picture of a low denomination $5 bill and then send that serial number to an encrypted, through an encrypted cell phone network to somebody in the Netherlands or Mexico or wherever you're moving money, take it to the bank or the illicit bank, get $30 million with a cell phone. Mr. Rivera, you mentioned that sort of rapid settlement, you know, was, it, was it an innovation of the crypto industry. I would submit to you that an encrypted tokenization was invented a long time before by a lot of shady characters. <laughs> right? The value Including of the that, US government. The, the value. The, U the U.S. government is not trying to break the law. The, this has tremendous value for people who want to break the law. I'm not saying that every crypto user is trying to break the law, but encrypted tokenization 
because I really want to separate the value proposition of the blockchain from the value proposition of an encrypted token that can get around KYC laws. So, Professor Allen, are you aware of anyone in the crypto space, anywhere within the system, who is tracking enough information about buyers and sellers on either side of a trade so that they are, are capable of complying with KYC AML laws and are doing so? I do not know if that's happening. Uh, I do know that the um, avoiding the anti-money laundering regulation is in many respects a feature rather than a bug of this business model. So th the problem with the blockchain is that it's actually quite inefficient when it compared with um, centralized alternatives. Because if you think about it, if you have a database where you have to um, create some kind of proof of work consensus or proof of stake to deter bad actors, that's going to be more computationally expensive than just having a centralized um, person add things to the blockchain. So because it's more expensive, the way that you usually see efficiency gains is from doing end runs around AML and KYC checks. So I want to get to one other thing just because I, I do think there's a case to be made. Again, if I'm, people often confuse me with Jay-Z. If I write a song, sell it to you, like the digital transaction, that's a value for the blockchain there because it's a digital thing that I can't get around. The, I, I want to introduce one more thing to the record, but Professor Allen, you had mentioned um, that a, I, I think in your testimony that a lot of the profits in the crypto industry are made by founders in Wales. We have had a tremendous number of people here who say this is about closing the racial wealth gap. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce a Washington Post article, Crypto is Not the Key to Black Generational Wealth, that notes that over the, uh, from 2017 to 2022, the median cryptocurrency declined by 46% and the Average stock market index rose by 56%, and that the, the losers are disproportionately black and brown communities who got in late. Without objection, that will be included in the record and conclude your question. <laughs> Thank you. I will yield back to you, Mr. Hill. <laughs> I, th I thank my friend. Mr. Flood is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's briefly take a step back and identify why we're here. The SEC and Gary Ginsler have forced this committee's hand. There is simply no way that the digital assets ecosystem within the United States will survive with some kind of action from Congress to combat the regulatory deluge we've seen in the past few months. We've all heard from firms like Coinbase that they will move offshore. The reality is that in this environment, it's hard to blame them. In February, the SEC issued a proposed rulemaking that would severely restrict the ability of current custodians for registered investment advisors to continue to hold custody of those assets. Mr. Rivera, I'd like you to briefly speak to some of the challenges associated with the proposed rulemaking from the SEC for qualified custodians and how it would affect your firm. Specifically, as it stands, how many options does your firm have to custody digital assets and would you expect this rulemaking to reduce your firm's options for providing custody services of digital assets? Our firm has a very limited number of digital asset custodians. There are three, perhaps four. There are three that we trust. Uh, this rulemaking effectively reduces that to maybe zero. Uh, it seems like the intent is to make it extremely difficult to comply with the rule as proposed, um, which would mean that we could effectively be disenfranchised from being able to invest in the ecosystem. Thank you. Next, I'd like to pivot to how broker-dealers work in the digital asset space and whether today's securities rules could possibly apply to the digital asset space as written. Broker-dealers that work with equities typically custody securities for their customers. However, with the current SEC custody rules, there is no way for a broker-dealer to directly custody customer assets. Uh, Mr. Zweihorn, Zweihorn. Can you describe what kinds of challenges this presents for broker-dealers within the digital asset space? Sure, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. Uh, so as you said, broker-dealers typically will custody their investor securities on their behalf, and that is part of the services they provide that facilitates the customer trading. Uh, the SEC has rules that regulate how broker-dealers do in order to protect customers, called the Customer Protection Rule, to ensure that those brokers don't mishandle or lose or steal those assets. That rule was adopted in the 70s originally. It's been amended over time. And not surprisingly, it doesn't refer to holding a crypto private key as one of the ways that a broker-dealer can permissibly hold a customer assets. 
the SEC has struggled uh, with determining what would be a safe mechanism uh, for bro uh, broker dealers to hold crypto assets for customers. And the most recent uh, step they took was to put out guidance that was time limited, uh, it expires actually three years from today, that would allow broker dealers to hold custody if they have reasonable policies and procedures, but then there's a list of other conditions that brokers essentially can't meet because it would mean they couldn't do any other business. Thank you. Let's move on to clearing and settling. Within the securities market, you need some sort of entity that ensures that a trade placed by an investor is ultimately settled between the buyer and the seller. The Depository Trust and the Clearing Corporation is the clearing agency that fills that role for securities. The current model, which requires a clearing agency, clear and settle trades, just doesn't really make sense for digital assets operated on a blockchain. Transactions clear in real time and there's no need for one. Centralized intermediary. Can you continue with this question? Uh, you mentioned in your testimony the perils of applying the definition of clearing agency under the Exchange Act to validators and miners on a blockchain that participate in the settlement process. Can you just elaborate, elaborate on that a little bit for me? Sure, so the definition of clearing agency under the Exchange Act is very broad and it includes anyone that is facilitating a settlement of a securities transaction without the physical delivery of paper security certificates. Uh, that definition made sense in its context where it was regulating the securities market, the traditional securities market, um, and trying to bring a higher level of safety and security to the market where paper certificates were moving or where they were becoming dematerialized. Everyone in digital assets is facilitating the transfer of the asset without physical delivery, whether they are securities or not. But if they are securities, then arguably uh, the definition would encompass a lot of different parties. Now if a firm um, like a digital asset trading platform holds all the assets itself so that it can update its books in real time with every trade, it doesn't really seem like you need a separate um, clearing agency to just add an intermediation that is not actually technically necessary. Thank you for your uh, answer. The, the, the final point I'll say, legislation is needed to fix this. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Flood. And turn to my friend from North Carolina, Mr. Nickel, for five minutes. Th thanks, Sarge. I'd like to thank Chairman Hill for holding today's hearing on digital asset market structure. I'm looking forward to working together in a bipartisan way to learn more about this issue and pass meaningful legislation. Uh, Mr. Rivera, you write in your testimony that you're, you're worried there's a growing sentiment that crypto technology will, quote, go away if we don't create new regulations. I'm concerned that if this is the case and all the trading venues were to exit the U.S. market, then any American looking to trade digital assets would find themselves having to use an offshore exchange. As we learned with the failure of Bahamas-based FTX.com and others, foreign firms are not always well regulated. It's my priority to protect my constituents. Mr. Rivera, do you have any concerns that a decline in the number of U.S. trading venues might produce new risks for American consumers? I do. I think that uh, th this is an example of a really unfortunate policy outcome from uh, you know, resulting from the enforcement actions that have happened from regulators, particularly the SEC. Um, if there are trading venues that offshore and U.S. persons want to trade in those venues, they will probably try to find ways to trade them, and the U.S. government will have a much uh, lesser ability to regulate the activity on those venues, and that would be unfortunate. And, and, and I, I, I have to apologize, I forgot to thank and acknowledge uh, Ranking Member Lynch for his outstanding leadership uh, on this committee, and most specifically and especially for keeping us all fed last night on the, this side of the aisle with some very well-timed pizza. We were here until 11.30 last night for a markup. So uh, I, I, uh, I am grateful for, for your leadership on well-timed pizza. Uh, um, uh, back to Mr. Rivera, in March of 2022, the SEC released Staff Accounting Bulletin 121, which effectively precludes banks from offering a digital asset custody um, at scale by requiring them to include on their balance sheets crypto assets that are custodied on behalf of their clients. This is a shift in historical practices. Custody assets have always been treated as off-balance sheet assets. If crypto companies don't have access to safe and secure banking, U.S. investors will be at risk. Mr. Rivera, uh, if banks can't provide this service, who would? Are you concerned that some may turn to offshore solutions? 
Indeed, um, that, that there should be meaningful engagement with custodi with uh, custodial providers in the in the ecosystem and banks. To the extent that they want to provide uh, custody to digital assets, they should have avenues that they can pursue to do that. Um, uh, SAB one twenty one uh, effectively limits their ability to do that in any meaningful way. It would be entirely too costly for them uh, to have to over collateralize the digital assets they hold as liabilities in their balance sheet. Thanks. Now, Ms. Belcher, to you, um, some, some have claimed that digital asset market structure legislation would only legitimize an industry seeking to facilitate illicit activities. Some have also claimed that digital assets are unnecessary and fail to add any new real value to our financial and technological systems. I'm doing my best to try to understand this issue and dig in. Um, could you provide us with some background on the use cases for Filecoin and the service that it is helping to provide? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. You know, Filecoin is just one example of cryptocurrency, but it is enabling hundreds of applications and use cases. Um, those include human rights applications. In addition to Starling Labs uh, International Criminal Court evidence verification, they're also storing the USC Shoah Foundation's genocide survivor testimony archives. Um, we also have with us here today uh, the Prelinger Archives, um, which is using decentralized technologies to store uh, rare films. We have the Freedom of the Press Foundation that's exploring using decentralized technologies for secure document exchange between journalists and anonymous sources. Guardian Project, building a mobile app for eyewitnesses that authenticates content captured on smartphones. Human rights data analysis group, exploring how this storage can be useful for accessing sensitive human rights data. Witness, um, uh, we also have investigative journalists using this technology. We have enterprise use cases. Um, there is uh, an organization called the Decentralized Storage Alliance that uses these technologies that includes uh, EY, Seagate, and AMD. Scientific data, not only stored by the Atlas Project at CERN, but also University of Maryland, University of Utah, and Berkeley's underground physics group. Um, and government data sets, an absolutely enormous amount of open data sets, not just the ones that I mentioned, but also the National Library of Medicine, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Center for Atmospheric Research, et cetera, et cetera. So there are just an enormous number of use cases, um, and all of those are enabled by the Filecoin network. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Appreciate that gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Donalds of Florida is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm actually glad I get to go last. I heard a lot in today's hearing. Obviously, um, we have some serious questions that Congress is going to need to address. And let's just be very clear, the SEC or the CFTC or frankly any other agency has not been empowered by Congress to just decide this stuff on the fly. Um, sorry, relative commissioners and chairmen that exist around this town, we've not authorized you to do that yet. Um, a couple things. One, I, I found it interesting that now Sam Bankman Freed is now the ghost of Christmas past. Um, you know, what happened at FTX is unconscionable, never tolerated, but that's accounting fraud. That's something that was contemplated under Sarbanes Oxley after the Enron scandal. So you have that. If we're going to talk about Russia avoiding our sanctions regime, regime using uh, cryptocurrencies, then maybe the administration should have paid attention to Russia's military buildup on the Ukrainian border after the debacle that was the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. If we're going to talk about the fentanyl crisis, maybe the administration should actually secure the border as opposed to just complaining about fentanyl all the time. And with respect to Filecoin or anything else, I think one of the most fundamental problems we have in this building are members of Congress trying to justify why an American would choose to buy a product that they want to acquire. We're not talking about narcotics here. We're not talking about food that you ingest. We're not talking about contact lenses that go in your eye. We are talking about a digital currency or assets or token that they might choose to buy with their own United States dollar. I thought that was okay in the US. But I see not all is reality here on Capitol Hill. Uh, Mr. Gorfine, question for you. Is the CFTC, or the federal government for that matter, currently equipped to serve as a market regulator for digital assets? So the, the CFTC, by virtue of overseeing futures, swaps, options that are predicated on commodities, gains very good understanding of commodities and the underlying markets and the asset. 
They currently don't have that authority to regulate the spot market, but as I noted earlier, there are some unique characteristics of digital commodities um, that may make it reasonable to say we need to have federal market supervision. So I, I like your answer, but I'm also down to two minutes and 36 <laughs> seconds. Um, I want to hone in on one thing. You, the operative word in your sentence is may. Does the CFTC, if this is the agency that looks like closest to be able, do they have the manpower, the technical knowledge, the expertise to adequately be a market regulator of digital assets? Yes, they already are, um, and they do have that expertise. They do have that knowledge. Chairman Benham has been testifying as such. Um, so this is something that they may need additional resources given the size and scope of digital commodity markets, um, but they do have that expertise and the professional staff there is well equipped to understand the underlying commodity market. Okay. Mr. Zweihorn, can you elaborate on some of the inca incompatibilities between the digital asset marketplace and traditional financial structure marketplaces? Sure. Well, so as, as we've talked about many times in this hearing, there are lots of digital assets that have functional uses. So in order to um, use Filecoin, for example, I don't believe Filecoin's a security, but if somebody did, if, if Congress was to say, or the SC was to say Filecoin's a security, then everybody that touches Filecoin would need to be a regulated intermediary. Hey, real quick, let me just say, as a member of Congress, Filecoin is not a security, but continue, go ahead. Better than, better than me. Uh, so if you were to buy Filecoin because you want to use it, you want to st store files, you can only buy it through registered broker-dealer. Uh, the, the, system through which it gets transferred to you would need to be a registered, uh, a registered exchange to actually find the buyer and seller and a clearing agency in order to actually send it to you. And, and those basically make it impossible to use for its intended purpose because you're not gonna have all of the entities involved in facilitating storage of data be SEC regulated for financial services activities. Okay, uh, last question, Mr. Rivera, given that Congress is already behind the curve regarding blockchain te technology, how do we ensure what is proposed today applies down the road? Applies how, what? How, how do we ensure that some of the topics and conversations that are being talked about today in this committee can apply down the road? What do you think is yeah. probably a best course of action for Yeah, we, we, we want collaboration by Congress, by members of this committee to take a very good look at the industry and understand all the different issues at play and come up with constructive legislation that, that regulators can then apply meaningfully to multiple different use cases and different, different types of assets. So we need principled legislation that is, uh, that's bipartisan and effective. All right, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donaldson. I want to thank uh, the panel today. Very informative. I look forward to comparing notes with our colleagues over in the uh, House Agriculture Digital Assets Subcommittee today and see what they learn. It's, again, I repeat, we've got 40 members of Congress engaging right now on trying to understand the digital asset marketplace uh, or the cryptocurrency marketplace and understanding how best uh, the U.S. government should be engaged. But what I heard today was, uh, you know, we have a real need for fit-for-purpose uh, regulatory tools that the SEC and the, and the CFTC I heard in the spot market, in dealing, uh, in registering something that's uh, not a security, clarifying uh, how the laws work, and of course, custody. So it was a very good uh, discussion. I thank my friend, Mr. Lynch, the ranking member, for our collaboration in uh, listening to your testimony and working on uh, potential legislation. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for their response. I ask each of our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned.